Good to be with you all this morning. Thankful for your presence. I'm glad we can be here and have the opportunity to worship God together and encourage one another and remind ourselves of what's most important, and that's His grace that reaches us, that we can have forgiveness of our sins and have that wonderful hope of eternal life in heaven. Let me invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Leviticus chapter 16. And please drop you a marker there, Leviticus chapter 16. And after you mark that place, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So that is marking your place at Leviticus chapter 16, and then turning over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll shortly pick up our reading there. This morning I want to talk with you about the ascension of Jesus and the important role it plays in the atonement of our sins. I think it's, this is all too often overlooked when we're talking about this subject of atonement and how the ascension of Jesus plays into this, not only plays into this, but plays a very, very significant role when it comes to our atonement and the forgiveness of our sins. As we begin to think about this, let's first of all notice A biblical, condition, a biblical definition, that is, of atonement. The Holman Bible Dictionary defines atonement this way. A biblical doctrine that God has reconciled sinners to Himself through the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. The concept of atonement spans both Testaments, everywhere pointing to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for the sins of the world. And that is true. Old and New Testaments alike, you have this picture of atonement being made, and the ultimate picture it's pointing to is what Jesus did for us so that we could have forgiveness of our sins. That sacrificial work of Jesus, that's just speaking of the gospel. And when Paul speaks of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he speaks of it in just this way. Pick up with me in chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Let's just stop right there. When Paul speaks of the gospel, what does he speak is at the very core of the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, pointing to that work of atonement that Jesus did for us. That is, in Him giving His life for the forgiveness of our sins. We can see that even more so in chapter 11 when Paul's writing to the church at Corinth in regard to the Lord's Supper. Uh, they had gotten a little bit disorderly when it came to the Lord's Supper. And Paul is trying to straighten them out in regard to this matter. But notice in chapter 11 in verse 23, when Paul reminds them of what he had already taught them about this. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took of the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Now stop just right there just for a second. In that whole statement that he just made here, he reminds them of the death, burial of Jesus Christ, right? Death and burial are here. He's talking about that body that was given. He's talking about the blood that was shed there. That's all speaking of Jesus' death. But then there's another aspect that gets brought into this, which is also the resurrection. Look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. We overlook that when we read this a lot of times. But what is he saying about that? If he's pointing out that the Lord's coming again, then it goes without saying that if He's coming again, He had to leave. Well, if He left here, then that means that He rose from the dead. But not only did He rise from the dead, but He ascended into heaven. And it's from there that He's coming again. So now all of that comes together now, doesn't it? Not only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but here Paul brings into the account the ascension of Jesus into heaven because he had to go somewhere to come from. Well, where did he go? Well, we know from the gospel accounts and from Acts chapter 1 that he ascended into heaven. And in Acts chapter 1, we're told there again, or at least the apostles are told there again, 
that he's coming back in the same manner in which he lived. So we see how all those things now tie together. And we often talk just about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And I'm not trying to make light of any of those things. They're all absolutely important, absolutely significant. But what about the ascension of Jesus into heaven? We don't often talk about the ascension of Jesus when we're talking about the atonement for our sins. We often mention the death, burial, and resurrection. But what I want to point out to us this morning of how significant and very important the ascension is and to what took place when atonement was made for our sins. As we do that, what I'd like for us to do is just go back to that Old Testament picture of atonement. Go back with me now to Leviticus chapter 16. In Leviticus chapter 16, we're being told about the Day of Atonement, which was one of the most special days, if not the most special day, when it came to the nation of Israel. Because on this day is when the high priest would go into the presence of God and he would make atonement for the sins of the people. And it was because of this that the people could maintain their fellowship with God. Apart from this, uh, they would be separated. But on this day, forgiveness was possible. And it was a very, very special day for these people. What we're told on this day is, is that there have been four animals that would have been chosen. There would have been a bull, two kid goats, and a ram. The ram would have been used for a burnt offering after this atonement took place. But beforehand, the ram and the two kids of goats would have been used. And first of all, the bull had to be used in regard to the high priest and his sons because atonement had to be made, first of all, for the priest. So the priest would appear, the high priest would appear on this day. He would take the bull of the sin offering and he would offer that and make atonement for himself and for his house. Pick up with me in verse 11 of chapter 16. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bull as the sin offering which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. So here you have Aaron going into the most holy place, the holy of holies, where the presence of God is there, sitting between the cherubim on the mercy seat. He would go in and set incense on fire, and the smoke of the incense would cloud the whole room. And Aaron would go in with the bull of that sin offering for himself and for his sons, and he would sprinkle that before the Lord and atone for his sins and the sins of his sons. And then Aaron would come back outside again. And by this time, lots have been cast and has, there has been decided which one of these goats is going to be the sin offering and which one is going to be the scapegoat. The scapegoat will be used later on, but the sin offering is going to be used for atoning for the sins of the people. The one that is the sin offering is then killed. And then Aaron would go in then and offer on behalf of the people. Pick up with me at verse 15. Then he shall kill the gold of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring his blood inside the veil. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull. And sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out, that he make, a, make atonement for himself, for his household, and for the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times Cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So after he's offered for himself and for his sons, he goes in in the same way and he offers for the sins of the people. And he comes back out and then again, everything has to be atoned for. The sins of these people has made everything around unclean, but Aaron goes through a process of making everything clean. 
Atonement has been made for everything. And at last, the ram would be offered as a burnt offering up to the Lord. But now as it stands, as all this has taken place, bull sin offerings have been made, then Aaron would come and he would lay his hands on the other kid of goats, which would be the scapegoat. And he would place all the sins of Israel upon the goat. And then the goat would be sent off into the wilderness, signifying that the sins of the people have been taken away. It's a very special day, no doubt. I want you to think about this with me. When exactly was atonement made? Was atonement made when the animal was killed? When the animal died, is that when atonement was made? No, as we were reading this, we saw that atonement only was completed when the blood was presented before God. It was then and only then that the people were then atoned for because the blood had been brought into the presence of the Lord and sprinkled there. It had been presented before God and then everything was completed. It was then and only then that the scapegoat could be sent away signifying that the sins of the people were no more. Now, I realize that this picture, this Old Testament picture, is just a foreshadowing of that which was going to come after Jesus came and became our high priest once and for all. But what this does is it paints a picture of actually what happened when Jesus did come. It's just a foreshadowing of that. Let's go forward into that New Testament picture now. What's that New Testament picture of atonement? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. As already mentioned, Jesus is our high priest. But Jesus, unlike the high priest of old, he didn't have to go in and offer for himself and for his own sins. Well, why? Well, the Hebrew writer tells us, beginning in verse 26, speaking of the high priesthood of Jesus. Hebrews 7 and verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Now, that's speaking of Jesus as our high priest today. It goes back to talk about those high priests of old that we talked about first of all, who first of all were not perfect. And before they could atone for the sins of the people, they had to make atonement for their own sin because they too, they were sinful people. But as we come to the reality today, which, which we have in Jesus Christ, we understand that we have a high priest who is sinless. He was separated from sinners. Though he came here and lived among us, he did so without sin. He did, he did that so that he could fulfill the law that was in place then so that he could become the one that could make atonement for our sins. And because he came here and he lived among us, and he knows the temptations, the trials, and the difficulties we face. He can sympathize with our weaknesses, though he does so without sin. Which makes Jesus that perfect, not only perfect high priest, but it makes him also the perfect sin offering. Not only is he the perfect high priest and sin offering, but he's also the perfect scapegoat, isn't he? You see how Jesus becomes all three of those? All three that we talked about in that Old Testament picture of atonement. The sin offering. Jesus has become the sin offering. Jesus is the high priest that offers the sin offering. And Jesus is a scapegoat that allows our sins to be carried away. But he was perfect in all areas so that he could become that for us. That which we could not provide for ourselves, nor could any man rightly provide for ourselves. That's why the system had to change. Because men were not without perfection. But Jesus was perfect. But Jesus didn't have to offer for himself, but what he did do was offer himself on behalf of us. He didn't have to take an animal sacrifice and make an offering. No, what Jesus did is he came and fulfilled that law, keeping it at every point, failing not at any point whatsoever. Jesus came and lived perfectly here among men, and he was able to die and become that perfect sacrifice. But how many times did he have to do that? Every year, Aaron would have to go in or some other high priest would have to go in and offer for the sins of the people. Every year. And every year was a reminder of how we're not up to snuff. We're no good. 
And every year, Aaron has a high priest, or whoever the high priest would be, would have to offer for themselves and remind themselves, we're no good. We're having to do this every year over and over again. And an insightful Jew would have to say, there's got to be something better. There's got to be something more. Well, there it is. It's Jesus. And Jesus came as that perfect sacrifice, and he offered once and for all. When Jesus offered, it was a one and done thing. And he offered for every person so that every person would now have the opportunity to have forgiveness of their sins. Yes, we all have sinned against God. All sin and fall short of his glory. And there's nothing that we can do in our own right. There's nothing that we can do in our own means to better that situation. We can't atone for our own sin. No matter how good we may think we are or no matter what we do. We had to have someone better than mankind to come and atone for us. And Jesus came and took on the role of mankind and made it possible for us in the offering of himself so that we could have atonement for our sins, so that we could be reconciled to God, so that God would no longer look upon us and see us as sinners, but he'd look upon us and see us as righteous. Reconciled to him to now have fellowship with him, not only here on this earth, but on into eternity. How special is that? Well, it's the very principle of everything that we are as Christians. Without that, we're nothing. But with this, we actually become something in Jesus Christ, don't we? But as you think about this picture of atonement and how important it is, was atonement completed when Jesus died? You know, in our minds, I think we think that. Please understand, and I'm not downplaying the death of Jesus. Why would I do that? I mean, it would be senseless for me to try to downplay that. I'm not downplaying that at all. I'm just trying to talk about the significance of every aspect. The death and burial of Jesus was very important. Without his death, there would have been no shedding of blood. However, the resurrection of Jesus was also very important too. Because without his resurrection, there would have been no him overcoming death. And therefore, we would have had no way. For resurrection life ourselves. But what about the ascension of Jesus? Is it not also important too? Think about it. Atonement wasn't completed at the death of Jesus. Why is that? Because just as in the Old Testament picture of atonement, when was atonement completed? It was completed when the blood was brought into the presence of God. When Jesus died and was buried, was his blood brought into the presence of God? No. No. When Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected from the dead, was his blood at that moment brought into the presence of God? No. Because Jesus was on earth for a good while after his resurrection, and he had not yet gone into the presence of God. So then there has to be another moment. There has to be another something that took place for Jesus to be able to bring his presence or his blood into the presence of God. Because that's the very moment that atonement is completed, right? And we read from the Bible that that did happen. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. In verses 6 through 10, the writer is speaking again of that Old Testament picture. That there were those priests of old who go into the tabernacle with blood of an animal. But Jesus went into a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not with the blood of any animal. Look at verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. There again, the Hebrew writer says here that Jesus, being our perfect high priest, who offered a perfect sacrifice for us, he took his blood into the heavenly holy of holies and he presented his blood before God. And that is the moment when eternal redemption was accomplished. Not before then, But at that moment, well, if Jesus accomplished and completed our atonement at the moment he presented his blood before God, then when did that happen? 
It didn't happen at his death. It didn't happen at the moment of his resurrection. It had then to happen at his ascension into heaven. Are y'all following me now? And how important the ascension of Jesus is to our atonement? And how little we speak of it when we talk about, oh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Again, all those things are very important. Let me illustrate it this way. We've got really good lights in here, don't we? I don't think the lights were very good before. I think they were pretty spotty. But now, I mean, we've got light. And it beams and we can see very well. But you know, the only way this light is possible is there's several steps that have to all be there working together. There's a transformer out there on the pole which brings power into this building going to a breaker box. And from that breaker box, you've got wire going to a switch on the wall. And from that switch on the wall, you've got a wire running to a fixture there. And even if all those things are in place and working as they should, you're never going to have light unless you screw a bulb into the fixture. If you have no bulb in the fixture, you'll sit here in darkness, even though everything else is in place just as it's supposed to be. Isn't that right? You can shake your head. Do you believe it? That's right, isn't it? You've got to have a light bulb in the fixture to have light. Everything is essentially important to have light, isn't it? Every step. Why don't we think about this in the same way? And I think we should because the Bible speaks of the importance of each and every step. The death and burial of Jesus, absolutely important. Prophesied, had to be fulfilled. No way for His blood to be shed so our sins could have a sacrifice to be forgiven. The resurrection of Jesus, prophesied, had to be fulfilled. No way we can have atonement without His resurrection because no way we could have resurrection life. What about the ascension of Jesus? The ascension of Jesus is absolutely important, isn't it? Because it's at the moment when Jesus ascended into heaven is when he went into the heavenly holy of holies and took his blood before God. And then, and only then, was atonement completed. The writer to the Hebrews said that that's when eternal salvation was accomplished. So when you think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we should also be thinking about the ascension also and add that to the discussion because every piece of that completes the picture. It completes the puzzle, if you will. Jesus emphasized the necessity of his ascension. In John chapter 20, after he rose from the dead and he appeared to Mary, and when Mary recognized who she was talking to, that it wasn't the gardener, this is Jesus, she ran to him, Rabboni. And you can almost see her running to him with her arms open to grab Jesus. What does Jesus say to her? Don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God. I had a brother tell me one time, and he was really serious about it, that Jesus ascended twice. That That's what he's saying to Mary here. That, that He's telling Mary, now I've got to go ascend to my Father, and then I've got to come back and stay here a little while and then ascend again. Uh, brethren, that's not what that's saying at all. What Jesus is saying to Mary is, is look, don't hold on to me like I'm going to be staying here forever. Because I'm not. I have got a work to finish and it's not yet finished. I've got atonement for the sins of the world to accomplish and I have not yet been able to do that because I have not yet sinned. So don't look upon me and hold on to me like I'm going to be here. Because I'm leaving. He said it twice here, didn't he? How important was the ascension to the Father? Well, Jesus made it very important right here because that's when atonement was going to be accomplished. It was the only way that we were going to be redeemed. Jesus had to ascend so the redemption could take place. Go with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. In chapter 4, John gives us that vision of that throne room scene in heaven. And John looks and he's able to see the one who sits on the throne. There's God the Father sitting on the throne and around Him are four living creatures. And around the four living creatures are the 24 elders. And all the four living creatures and the 24 elders do is worship the one who sits upon the throne because of who He is. It's God. God the Father. 
And as the scene now shifts to chapter 5, John now sees another character brought into the story. Look with me to verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Let's just stop right there for a minute. John sees this picture up there. There's, there's the one sitting upon the throne. There's God. God the Father, in the right hand of the Father, is a scroll. It's written on front and back, which means it's full. It's complete. It's sealed up with seven seals. It's perfectly sealed. And in that scroll is, is to depict God's plan of redemption for mankind. And there's supposed to be one that's supposed to come and be able to take this and, and carry out and execute God's plan of redemption. But a strong angel cries out and says that there's no one worthy. Who's worthy to take the scroll and open its seals? And the text says that there was no one on earth or under heaven that was able to open it or look at it. Go back to that Old Testament picture. Who could do it? Who on earth could do it? Who on earth could reconcile themselves to God and redeem themselves? No one could. And John began to weep as he looks at this picture. But one of the elders says, now hold on a minute. Here's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He can take the scroll and he can open its seals. Why? Because he's worthy. And John looked to, to behold this lion and what did he see? In the midst of the elders and the four living creatures there at the throne, he saw a lamb as if it was slain. I wonder who that is. That's Jesus, isn't it? We know who that is. That's Jesus. There's Jesus having ascended into heaven. This is the picture of Jesus' ascension. And Jesus there coming into the throne room of God with his blood and offering his blood. And now we have a perfect high priest having offered a perfect sacrifice, one who has perfected all things, who is now able to take God's plan of redemption and execute it in every way beyond a shadow of a doubt. Jesus is worthy because He's the only one that can do it. He's the only one that can fill the bill. And because Jesus takes the scroll out of the right hand and is able to open it and carry out God's plan of redemption, what we have breaking loose in heaven is a great, great praise and worship. Look at verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and forever. Why do we have this great outburst of praise there in heaven? Why are all of these worshiping around the throne? Why is all of this going on? It's because that redemption has been accomplished. 
It's because the plan has been fulfilled. Jesus has now died. He's risen from the dead. But not only that, brethren, do you see? He ascended into heaven. He went into that throne room that John saw and he carried his blood before God and atonement was completed for you and me and for every person upon the earth. And now all of us who have offended God by our sins can make that right. Now we can find forgiveness because Jesus is worthy and there's no other person in all the wide world at any time or place that is worthy to do that. Only our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the importance? So it's not only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, is it? It's the ascension as well, isn't it? Because that's when everything was accomplished. And as you go to the book of Acts, you know, Andrew and I were talking about this the other day. We're guilty of it too. We start talking about the book of Acts and where do we usually immediately start talking about? Chapter 2. Because we think everything, you know, begins there at chapter 2. But where did Luke begin? In chapter 1, Luke began at the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, didn't he? That's where everything began. Because if Jesus had not ascended, His blood would not have been offered in the presence of God. If His blood not had not been offered in the presence of God, then the plan is not in place. There is no hope. But it's after the ascension of Jesus when the church began. There's the story, right? We don't have to turn there. We should all know what goes on there. Acts chapter 1, that's Luke and the 11 out there. You know, as Jesus is giving them parting instructions, he begins to lift up in the air and ascend into heaven. And those angels say to him, now listen, this Jesus who's left in this way, he's coming again. And after that, you have that picture that we just read in Revelation 4 and 5. From the time Jesus ascended into heaven until Acts 2 begins, you have that Revelation 4 and 5 story taking place. Jesus going in and offering His blood and atonement being completed. And then, the next thing you know, what happens? The Holy Spirit sin. And Jesus talked about the importance of that before He ever left. In John 16, He told them, you know what, it's, a, it's to your favor that I leave. It's to your benefit. Because if I do not go, the Holy Spirit cannot come. But if I leave, I'll send him to you. And did he not do that? He most certainly did. In Acts chapter 2, we find that Jesus there in heaven pours out the Holy Spirit. The apostles receive it just as was promised. And now they're able, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, to reveal and confirm the Word of God. Now people can know, have the keys to the kingdom, and know exactly what to do to find forgiveness of sins and become Christians. And as the story goes on, that's just what you see. The rest of Acts chapter 2, the gospel is preached. You have the first gospel sermon preached after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus into heaven. See how the ascension is important in that story now? Because it's only after the ascension that the gospel was preached, because then the Holy Spirit was sent. The Holy Spirit couldn't be sent unless Jesus had ascended. So you see, there's another very important aspect of the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And once the Holy Spirit is sent, the gospel is preached, and it's after the gospel is preached that disciples are made and added to the church. It's then and only then that that can actually happen. Why? Because it's then and only then that atonement has been completed for their sins. Now, that's a, that's a really great picture, isn't it? And I hope this morning that I have done just that. It's helped complete that picture. I'm again not trying to make light of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Is that what, the third time that I've said that now? And I hope I've got that point across. I'm not trying to make light of it. Every piece of that is absolutely important and necessary. But what I want us to understand is the ascension is just important and just as necessary. Because without it, there's no forgiveness. And it helps us understand other passages of Scripture too. Especially this one. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. You read that passage there and it says, Therefore he says, it's quoting prophecy, but it's applied to Jesus. 
When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. When did Jesus leave captivity, lead captivity captive? Do you understand what he's talking about there? We were once held captive in our sins to Satan. We were captives of Satan because of our sins. But when Jesus ascended into heaven and offered his blood in the presence of God, atonement was made, and now it's no longer uh, our destiny to be held and captive to sin and Satan. Now we can be freed from that bondage and we can be captives of Jesus, that is, slaves of righteousness. But when does the Holy Spirit say that actually took place? When was the moment? It's when he ascended on high. And there again, when he ascended on high, that's when he was able to give gifts to men. There's the idea that when the Holy Spirit was sent, then all of those teaching positions that are written about in Ephesians chapter 4, after this is said, are then now in place. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has now been sent. Now the apostles have everything that pertains to life and godliness. And that's not only being preached, and it's going to be written down. And all of those teaching positions are going to be effective now for the local church. Why? Because Jesus ascended. And it says something about this passage too. In 1 John chapter 2, in verse 2, speaking of Jesus, John writes, and He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That word propitiation there, you don't use that in conversation very much, do you? But you know what that's, that word is very similar to? Atonement. You can just read it that way. That Jesus is the atonement for our sins. John's writing to those Christians in that day and saying, that's what Jesus is. He appeased the wrath of God that was coming against us because of our sins. We offended God. The God who created us and gives us life and breath and all things, we've offended Him. And what we deserve is death. Spiritual death. But God didn't want that. No, God wanted people who could have fellowship with, he, with Him, not only here on this earth, but on into eternity forever. But the only way that could be accomplished is that atonement had to be made. And Jesus became that. He became that sacrifice that was offered and it appeased the wrath of God, not only for us, but for every person. So that every person that's walked upon this earth, could find forgiveness of their sins. If you're a Christian here this morning, you're enjoying that. And there's nothing more important than this world, than having that atonement for our sins. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you don't have that. You know, Jesus is coming again one day. And for those who have taken part in this great sacrifice, well, they have that promise of going home to heaven and enjoying that life of glory from here all throughout eternity in heaven. But you know what the opposite of heaven is, don't you? It's hell. You know how hell is described in the Bible? A place of brimstone and fire, a lake of brimstone and fire. You know why it's described that way? Because I think in human terms, that's probably the worst thing we can think of. A lake of brimstone and fire? I mean, that's the worst torment you could ever face. But let me tell you this. The, the figure is always less than the reality. Hell's going to be a lot worse than any lake of brimstone and fire. You know why? Because God's not going to be there. You know, God has blessed this earth and continues to bless this earth. And as we live upon this earth, even those people who aren't Christians are being blessed by the hand of God. But one day... Apart from obedience to the gospel, you'll spend an eternity out of the presence of God. God will not be there. That'll be the worst thing that anybody could ever imagine. Far worse than any lake of brimstone and fire. However, heaven's pictured as streets of gold and gates of pearl. And I think that's probably some of the finest things that we could ever think of. But in the same way, the figure is always less than the reality. Heaven's going to be far greater than any streets of gold and gates of pearl. But do you know why? It's because God's going to be there. And that's all that matters. Being in the presence of a God and a Lord who gave His life for us, bought us with a price we could never pay, that I was never worthy to receive. Atonement made through His death, burial, and resurrection. 
If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we urge you and encourage you to take part in that. We want to help you and we stand ready. If you're ready to repent of your sins, be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins, please come this morning while you have the opportunity. If you're a Christian here and you need help in any way to make your life right with God, please do that as we stand and we sing this song.